All righty. First thing is first. You remember a while ago I said I would start a petition to stop Greg Fergus, the House Speaker here in Canada, from muting the microphone? Well, I have an announcement. I don't have the petition just yet. This, this, this takes time, folks. This takes a lot of time. And I'm super impatient. You know, to go to talk to members of parliament at their office, you have to book an appointment. You have to call ahead. You have to book a time. Who's got time for that? I certainly don't. So I've busted down the door like the Kool-Aid man. Not really. I've just knocked and called until somebody finally answered the door. And I've started the process. And, folks, we're almost there. So I just want, I just want you to keep that in your brain because... Maybe later this week, the petition will be ready to go. And it's going to shock the system. It's going to shock Canada. And it's going to take away the freaking mute button from Greg Fergus. Welcome back to the channel. Welcome back to another video, everybody. Before we get into it, I do want to encourage you all to smash the like button and subscribe if you haven't already. It does really help grow the channel. we got a couple different things to take a look at. We have the federal polls are updated, and it might make you a little bit angry, but nonetheless, they're still updated. Then the BC election is still inconclusive. It doesn't take a day or two days or even three days to figure out, you know, how many ballots are counted and how many weren't counted. No, it's going to take like a week or two, which is crazy so that's obviously a little hmm suspicious and then Jagmeet Singh gave a press conference about hey we need to really focus on Indian government foreign interference but it's kind of funny because like he's quite literally banned from India so we're going to be taking a look at all of these things in this video and without further ado let's get into it so of course we're gonna start off with the polls Pierre Polyev has gone uh, upwards if you're in Australia in um, everywhere else in the world, he's gone down. He went from 221, 222, down to 219. I don't know how, but nonetheless, still happened. Justin Trudeau went up. What? What the, what's, what's wrong with this? You got to turn it off and turn it back on again. I think it's broken. Justin Trudeau went up from 56 or 57 up to 58. The block, the block went up one seat and Jagmeet went up another seat. What the heck is going on? But not to worry, folks, because conservatives, Pierre Polyev, are still 99% likely across the board of not only winning the most seats, but odds of a majority government. So they can they can take a seat or two here and there, you know, but at the end of the day, for the liberal seat, tout fini. Now let's take a look at what the actual heck is going on with the BC elections. This is bizarre. I don't think I've ever seen anything like this for something in Canada to take so long, but here we go. Up for all the parties in different regions. One of the biggest stories here was the defeat of Green Party leader Sonia Furstenau. Her party still stands, though, two MLAs. That's the, the capital, Green Party she leader. She didn't even win her own ride. Major change here on the island was the Greens. Uh, Rob Botterall uh, took the Saanich North and Islands riding as we whip through some of the other results. Not much change. Where the NDP won in the past, the party won again from the central part of the island down through Nanaimo. Also, it was expected to be a battleground there, but the NDP taking both seats there, the Cowichan Valley going orange again, and much on the South Island, same picture outside of the ridings already mentioned. The NDP dominating the southern part of the island, and as Dean Stoltz, show, uh, Dean Stoltz showed us moments ago, a much different picture uh, through the north, where we're going to have much more on this developing story, as BCers still have to wait again uh, for who will be the next government and our premier of our province, and what deals need to be made coming up uh, we have much more on this. Joining us now, we have our very own political correspondent, Rob Shaw, after last night's uh, huge coverage. Thank you for taking the time. You must be exhausted. I know you've been on the trail all the time, finally capping off, wanting to put a bow on it all last night. And once again, deja vu 2017. We're not there yet. No, we are back actually kind of very similar to 2017. I was analyzing what David Eby said today, which is, hey, we won the popular vote. We won the most number of seats. We're going to govern almost identical to Christy Clark in 2017 in terms of language. So, you know, there's that old uh, line uh, from, I think, a Batman movie. You, uh, you either die uh, the hero or you end up becoming the villain. So now the NDP are... <laughs> Live long enough to see yourself become the villain. But last night I thought was really kind of extraordinary because we changed the electoral map to erase some of the NDP wave from 2017 and 2020, and you were talking a bit about that. And so we've kind of reset in some cases um, where voters were at uh, just a few years ago. And looking, going ahead, it's, let's say the numbers stay as is, 
What do you? What does a legislature look like to you? Like how? What? What? As BCers, as civilians, how are we operating with a, this type of government? Well, it's still functional. And I think, you know, if we keep the numbers that we have right now and in the past in 2017, we saw that recounts and the kind of mail in ballots that arrive after deadlines for advanced voting, which is what we'll be counting here. They don't really change the trend lines of how people voted. The parties sort of maintain that. And in that situation, you do have a functional parliament. You can make it work with the numbers that we see here. The question is for how long? And that was 2017, a four-year confidence and supply agreement between the Greens and the NDP that in year three, the NDP grabbed, ripped up, tossed in the garbage, turned on the Greens, and tried to run them out of office. So the Greens are going to be very hesitant to sign a long-term deal here. Yes, you can run Parliament, but a lot of us are thinking here, you got a year, maybe two years tops uh, if you're the NDP to try and get the Greens to cooperate. And you're going to have to be very flexible because... You know, fool me once, shame on you, but fool me twice, the Greens are going to be watching the NDP for sure. And that wasn't from a Batman movie. No, no. I, I, I don't it want was to... actually the Riddler, I think, was... said it. But that's, that's <laughs> I don't want to jump the gun and I don't want to speculate uh, too much, but it's politics. How much of this rests on David Eby? You had a majority going into this. Uh, Horrigan had, I don't know if the dynasty is the right word, but he had full control over the province. Are people going to be coming after Eby's head if this is what the NDP is going to look like in government. Yeah, when you look at the failures of the NDP here, and they won, but they also lost this election, you have to go back to the start of David Eby 22 months ago. He ran a very centralized premier's office. He brought in unelected special advisors who handled really contentious issues like the Land Act changes for Indigenous reconciliation. Their names weren't on the ballot. But the people who had to push those files into reality, Nathan Cullen, the lands minister, he lost his job last night. So David Eby is going to be challenged to reconstitute a premier's office run very centralized by him when he no longer looks like the smartest political strategist in the room by special advisors who left a mess in their wake. That is going to be tough. And that's the kind of premier he is. He's not, he's a lone wolf. He's not a let's work with everyone. And is he going to be a a new version of himself in this premier's office? Um, And will the NDP want him to be their leader in the next election? Those are big questions. Will the conservatives want John Rustad to be their leader in the next election as well? Those Those are existential questions that leadership reviews and party race postmortems are going to get into uh, in the months ahead. All right. So I've said this before on a video. I said this at my local watch party while the elections were taking place. If the NDP continues their regime of terror, I'm going to be homeschooling my kids without a doubt. I'm not putting my kids into the curriculum while Soji is in place here in BC. It's just not happening. John Rustad, who's running as the you know potential premier of conservative or premier of BC as a conservative party leader of British Columbia, has said that he's going to wipe Soji off the map. It's not going to exist, and he's going to be taking apart the carbon tax on fuel right away. So gas is going to go down twenty five to thirty five cents, just like that. I mean, for those reasons and those reasons alone, that should be enough to have voted for the Conservative Party of. British Columbia. But I mean, I, I, I voted for that along many other reasons. I'd love to know if you guys did vote in, in BC, who you voted for and why. And now we're going to take a look at our boy Jagmeet. So I, I, I still don't understand this. But nonetheless, when you go on, uh, on the Googles here and you type in, is Jagmeet Singh banned from India? This is what I've found. Why is Jagmeet Singh not allowed to travel to India? Seek matters and relations with India. In 2018, Jagmeet Singh called on the federal government to do likewise. In 2013, Singh was denied a visa to India for raising the issue of the anti-Sikh riots. He was reportedly the first Western legislator ever to be denied entry to India. And it's not changed. It's never been reversed. And from everyone's understanding... Jagmeet Singh is still banned from India, which is quite an accomplishment to have made. Probably the largest accomplishment that Jagmeet has ever done in his entire career. And now he's doubling down on the fact that we need to investigate India for foreign interference, which is extremely controversial. Now, I know there's 
quite a few, especially when I talk about the Indian, you know, relations between Canada and India, there's quite a few, you know, people from India, Indian backgrounds that watch these videos. And look, Canada has had a, a phenomenal relationship, a fine relationship, a great, a good relationship, whatever word you want to use. It's been a positive relationship with India for an extremely long time. And Justin Trudeau has made these wild accusations Publicly, if you're going to make those accusations as the prime minister of a country, you better like have undeniable proof and then you better Im impose sanctions and just say, okay, hey, no, we're, you're, you're kaputs, you're done. But that's not the case. It's almost like Justin Trudeau is trying to wave the ban hammer as a, you know, as, as like a, a show of authority, but not fully commit to it, which is what's so bizarre. And, and you, you saw this with a previous video I posted on this channel where I think one of the, it wasn't an expelled diplomat, my bad, everybody. He was a, um, recalled diplomat from India, which then the government of Canada later, like many hours later, expelled him, went and did a one-on-one -on -one with Vashi on CTV. And I, I was, albeit a little hungover at the time. So my interpretation of, uh, of what was, uh, what was said in the events were not on the ball <laughs> because of the hangover. But nonetheless, uh, I just feel like a lot of these issues should be dealt with behind closed doors and it shouldn't be aired publicly like this. this. This isn't a good look on Canada at all. So here we are with Jagmeet saying, going again, let's, uh, let's, let's block, let's, bl or, or, they're commenting on the fact that um, people, different parties are trying to block uh, the investigation into Indian inter interference. And I just don't get it, man. Deal with this stuff. In private, stop trying to pick a fight with the largest democracy in the world. Get the speaker to accept that today as something that necessitated an emergency debate. Only a week ago, we learned of these really chilling details of, of a foreign government hiring gangs to commit a campaign of terror impacting Canadians. But I am disappointed that the Liberals shut down our attempt to bring in a Canada-India relations committee, similar to the Canada-China committee. <clears throat> what, I'm, what I'm disappointed by is that this is an ongoing trend I've seen with the Liberals. They put up barricade after barricade, block after block to pursue foreign interference. We had demanded a public inquiry, and you'll recall the government said no. Again and again, they put up barriers. They brought in a special rapporteur. We said that is not sufficient. That's not good enough. We had to fight the, that, that step at every step of the way to finally get a public inquiry. And now when we're calling for a Canada-India Relations Committee to look at what's going on, to investigate what the threats are to Canadians, to really dig in and to do that important work, the Liberals again put up a blockade and said no. I know that the work of this committee may not look good on the Liberals and on their inaction. It may not look good on Justin Trudeau and the Liberals. But as the Prime Minister himself said, there are parliamentarians that are directly alleged to be involved specifically, as the Prime Minister said, conservative parliamentarians that are connected to foreign interference coming from the Indian government. Okay, so this is something that should, this, this in particular, what he just said, should absolutely be made public. If you have undeniable evidence that somebody in Canada, especially an effect, uh, affected elected official here in this country is committing a form of foreign interfere complicit with foreign interference and essentially you know committing a form of treason their names should be public they should not remain in office you shouldn't have to see a top or have a top secret security clearance to be able to see behind um behind that veil of what the hell is is actually happening this is something that is you know directly impact or directly impacts our national security and if this person still is in the house of commons which is what jagmeet singh just today or during the last question period you know quoted that hey there could be traitors in the house today why not just point them out and do what every single canadian wants you to do name the names even if it's a conservative party absolutely even more reason why we should know the names so that we can make judgment calls us the voters that vote you people in the fact that they're hiding this is insane the only person within government right now the only party within government that's saying let's be transparent about this and release the names is the conservatives right that's why that, that's why pierre is under attack but from all different parties the green party's going ah He's, he's trying to breach top security. Jagmeet is doing the same thing, and so is Justin Trudeau. So I, I, don't, I don't understand that. Maybe I'm 
naive. Maybe I'm, maybe there's just a piece of the puzzle that I'm not fully comprehending, but that's my opinion. And I would love to know yours. That is serious. We need to take it seriously and we need to do the important work of examining what's going on ultimately because we need to keep Canadians safe. This is something that I've said again and again. This is a time that calls for us to put Canada first, party second. And I've seen both from Pierre Polyev refusing to get his security clearance, refusing to do what's necessary to protect our democracy, and from Justin Trudeau, who is very slow in taking steps. We've seen both parties put their parties ahead of the country. I believe a leader needs to put the country first. And so we'll continue to fight hard to make sure we are protecting Canadians, we are protecting our democracy, we are keeping people safe. So I look forward to the debate tonight where we talk about what those steps need to look like. And I'll continue to push for a committee that will constantly look at, will be ongoing looking at the relationship between Canada and India with a view to keeping Canadians safe. I'll do that in French and then I look forward to your questions. Uh, donc, uh, je... Yeah, I think that Jagmeet has really lost um, a lot of his reputation, even from NDP supporters. Like, I just, I don't know how anyone who supports Jagmeet can still support him after I mean it goes directly against what the previous leader of the NDP has said Tom Mulcair which is somebody that I, I don't agree with on like 90 to 99 percent of the things that he says but on this particular topic the previous Jagmeet Singh the previous leader of the NDP party has said many times on the record I do not think that Pierre should get the top secret security clearance because it will muzzle him. So I'm going to trust Tom Mulcair, which is like a crazy thing. And please don't ever clip that. Don't download that. Don't, don't ever quote me on that. Cause that's going to come back and bite me in the ass at some point. But I am in this very specific moment in time, I'm going to trust Tom Mulcair's um, analysis of the situation that it will muzzle him. Whereas all of these other people want to shut Pierre up as fast as possible. And they're saying it's not going to muzzle him while also not saying anything about the report or the situation. But they're saying that it's they're not muzzled. I just that doesn't make any sense. Like anyone with critical thinking can realize, yeah, you're you're lying. Are you so sure it's the liberals that uh, said no to this committee? I thought it would be the Conservatives, given the fact that their leader is unwilling to look at, to get a security clearance, given the fact there's allegations directly touching the Conservative Party from foreign interference, specifically from India and the Indian government, the fact that the Prime Minister pointed out that members of Parliament or parliamentarians from the Conservative Party are involved in, or are compromised. I thought it would be the Conservatives, but we were paying close attention, and the no came from, it looked like, Mr. Lamoureux from the Liberal side. And so it came from the, the liberal side, and that's another example of uh, liberals, I don't understand why, but putting up a barrier, stopping the important work of getting down to what's actually going on. How are Canadians being impacted, and what more can we do to protect Canadians? Do you think the liberals are trying to hide something? I, I don't know what the, why the liberals would say no. Um, I know the conservatives seem like they're hiding something. They're unwilling to even know what's going on, and they're turning a, a blind eye. They're looking away from the heinous acts of a foreign government committing violence and criminal activity on Canadian soil. So that, that's clear from the conservative behavior, but I don't understand why the Liberals would say no to this when it is an important step to have accountability, to keep Canadians safe, to dig into what's going on, how far is this, and how much more do we need to do to keep Canadians safe? Um, last week, you... They're hiding something. Even though they don't know anything, they're still somehow hiding something. Check me, what do you think they're hiding? Like, why don't you just speculate for the love of God, right? Like, it doesn't make any sense. He, this is a nothing burger press conference. He's making himself look like an absolute idiot. Didn't want to answer the question about whether you've received any threats personally. And then um, later in that same week, um, a story came out that your brother-in-law had been warned about threats to his safety. I'll ask you again if you uh, can answer whether or not you face threats. And then also, do you feel like the Liberal government is taking threats to the Sikh community seriously? Um, like I said, it's not about me. And so I'm going to focus on the threats that, that Canadians are faced with. I think it's really important to point out it is something that's truly a threat to all Canadians. When people are being extorted, when guns and gangs are involved and bullets are flying, everyone is impacted. When a foreign government's hiring and instructing criminal gangs in Canada to go out and engage in violence, that is a threat to all Canadians. So I really want to highlight that. Um, and with respect to the Liberals, I found that they've been slow to act. 
They've been hesitant. They've, they've said, no, we've had to fight them for accountability. We had to fight them to bring in the public inquiry. They said no again and again. And I kept on getting saying, no, we need a public inquiry. We need to make this independent. This is very serious. We've got to protect Canadians and our democracy and our system. And the Liberals said no again and again. So we had to fight hard to get us here. So my, my critique of them was, again, that delay, the fact that they said no, the fact that we had to push them and fight them. And now again, they said no to the Canada-India uh, Relations Committee. Another example of them saying no when they should be saying yes to protecting Canadians. Yeah, it's NDP leader Jagmeet Singh talking about the latest developments in the House of Commons and calls to address the recent spat between the governments of India and Canada and the emergency debate tonight amid concerns about the safety of Canadian citizens. Yeah, I mean, Jagmeet, you have a real opportunity to um, do what's best for Canada and just come out and say, hey, look, I have been targeted and this is why we should take it seriously. And if that's the case, then, then phenomenal, right? Not in the sense of phenomenal you've been targeted, but yeah, we should take this more seriously. Look, I don't, I don't like Jagmeet. I don't like him at all, right? I disagree with the majority of what he says. But if he is be being targeted by foreign interference, or if there's been threats to his life by foreign governments, that's not okay. Not at all. In fact, no Canadian politician, no Canadian citizen should ever be at that in that position of threatened by foreign governments, right? I think the the thing that Canada, the, at least the government, needs to very much clarify is this is all around the killing or the murder of one individual, right? A a, I don't know, a Sikh separatist or a Khalistani separatist, right? Najar Singh that was murdered. Um, he was the he was the head of the Gurdwap, um, like, temple or religious area in Surrey. If I sound incompetent with this, probably for a reason. It's not really my go-to expertise, but nonetheless, he was a Indian um, separatists labeled as a terrorist by the Indian government. And so why are we who respects Indian democracy has good political relations with, why are we taking an Indian terrorist into this country and allowing him to establish, not only establish roots here, but continue that Indian terrorist type of rhetoric here and build more like-minded people and groups that are calling for, you know, either terrorist activities in India or the death of India. Like that's, that's insane. If the roles were reversed, if you had a separatist party or separatist organization that went to India and were calling for, you know, the death of Canadian politicians and blah, 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 and had a big enough movement that there was the same stuff happening here in Canada where it was like an echo, then I don't think Justin Trudeau would say, hey, that's fine. Freedom of speech. He'd be saying, hey, no, hey, India, can you can you shut that down, please? That's not OK. And so like that's that type of reciprocal act. It, it's just it's not happening. And I'm pretty certain if I'm not mistaken, the Indian government did say many times, hey, that guy that you've got there, that Khalistan, Khalistani separatist terrorist, that's not OK. You got to shut that down. You have to address that. And I believe that the government of Canada hasn't done anything. Now, if the government of India pulled off a murder, right, then obviously that's not OK. But the issue is not necessarily focused on that, which is also an issue to focus on. But it's more of the bigger scope of how did we let this person in here, why did we not comply with India? Why didn't we not work with the government to solve this? And so that's, I think, what is on a lot of people's minds, or at least mine. So I've shared my opinion, and now I'd love to know what you guys think down below in the comments. And to wrap things up, in case you missed it earlier today or the, the previous question period, you had Pierre Polyev go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Christian Freeland, where Christian Freeland said something that was super bizarre. She pretty much solved the food crisis, at least in a certain area, because she went and handed out Bannock. That's a literal thing that she said. I don't know. It's kind of crazy. But nonetheless, I'm going to play that one little clip of that in case you missed it. Here you go. This weekend in Cloverdale, 15,000 people lined up in the pouring rain for the hopes that they might get a few rejected potatoes. It was ugly potato day in that city. And 15,000 British Columbians are too hungry and desperate that they needed to go and collect those rejected foodstuffs. 
Two million Canadians are lined up at food banks. Wow. There are 1,400 homeless encampments in Ontario today. And what is the Prime Minister doing? Working to save his political skin from his revolting caucus. This can't go on. Will he call a carbon tax election yeah. now? Yeah. Mm-hmm. The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of Finance. Mr. Speaker, I would really hope that every single MP in this House would agree that in our great country, no one should ever go hungry. But when Conservatives talk about the most vulnerable, there should be no buts. Crocodile tears. And how do I know that, Mr. Speaker? I know that because they have had the gall to vote against a national school food program, a program that will feed 400,000 Canadian kids. How could they look themselves in the face when they oppose feeding Canadian kids? Yes. Man, what the hell is wrong with this lady? The opposition. That program, though it has costed millions, has not fed a single hungry child. It has fed bureaucracy, which is all it ever was intended to do. Meanwhile, two million people are lined up at food banks. We've got 15,000 people that will line up for a, quote, ugly potato because they can't afford to eat. We have diseases like scurvy that are back. And one in four kids go to school hungry after nine years of this prime minister. Yet his priority is saving his political career from his revolting caucus. This cannot go on. Will he call a carbon tax election? Yeah. Yeah. The Honourable... Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of Finance. Mr. Speaker, the Conservatives are damning themselves with their own words. I was at a school in downtown Winnipeg on Friday. I was there with Premier Wab Canoe, and we gave those beautiful, wonderful children some bannock, a little carton of milk. Hey, I've had bannock. Some butter and a banana. That was not bureaucracy that fed those kids. That was the deal we've done with Manitoba. The Conservatives are being feeding kids. So you're a better person because you fed people bannock? The honorable. That's like a pretty racist thing to say. Leader of the opposition. Are you kidding me? She says that the Canadians should be happy that while one in four kids go to school hungry, while two million people line up at food banks, while scurvy is making a comeback after nine years of this government, Canadians should be grateful that she showed up with a few snacks and a photo op yeah. at one school. Yeah. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, okay. this is the same finance minister who has wow. back $7 billion past her deficit target, right. meaning more inflation and higher rates. Meanwhile, the prime minister hides in the fetal position under his desk. Will he... <laughs> Put some W's in the chat. Oh, mon dieu, tout pity. Prime Minister and Minister of Finance. Mr. Speaker. <laughs> oh, she's so triggered. the leader of the opposition off his game. This because how can he have the temerity to talk about actual meals fed to actual children as bureaucracy. That tells you how cynical and how low these Canadians go. And then he talks about inflation. Mr. Speaker, it's been in the Bank of Canada's target range for nine months in a row. It fell below 2% in September. And rates have come down. That's what's happening with inflation. Oh, she got her ass handed to her. Oh, that was brutal. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the end of the video. I'd love to know what you guys think down below in the comments about any of the topics that were covered. If you haven't yet already, I'd like to encourage you guys to smash the like button and subscribe. And I will see you all in the next one. Bye for now.